This is Greg Pass with the Americans in Wartime Museum. Today's date is November the 7th, 2021. And I have the pleasure of sitting down with Richard Barnes. We're at Arlington National Cemetery today. Right. Um, Rick, correct? Thank you, yes. Rick, and thanks for I'm, coming I'm in. I'm sorry, Greg. Greg, Greg. yep. Got it. Okay. So, um, Rick, <coughs> thanks for coming in and um, taking take about a half hour of your day to, oh, to tell, tell us I'm, some stories. I'm glad to help you guys out. So, what's your full name? My name is Richard Paul Barnes, but everybody calls me Rick. Mm -hmm. So, um, where, where were you born at, Rick? I was born in Elmira, New York, a uh, small town in upstate New York, about six miles from the Pennsylvania border. Gotcha. Something like that. Any veterans in your family? My dad served in World War II. Um, he was uh, in the campaign of the Rhine, if I'm not mistaken. Um, served there. Um, he was in ordinance. He was a truck driver. He carried supplies and spare parts for you know tanks and other uh, material. And um, that was his mission over there at that time. Okay. Served a couple of years, you know. Um, he wanted to join at the beginning of World War II. Um, he had uh, hearing difficulties from scarlet fever as a young boy, uh, and they didn't take him at first. And as the war went on and on and on, you know, I hate to say they lowered their standards, but it was basically, mm -hmm. you know, we can use whoever we can use. Yeah. And so finally they said, okay, we'll take you. And so uh, my dad came in. Gotcha. So, um, so how'd you get in, in, into the military service? Oh, this is really interesting. <clears throat> um, I was a music major in high school, as strange as that may sound, um, particularly from a public school, because I went through a school system where they looked at music as an equivalent um, academic area of English or history or math or science. And I graduated from high school as a music major. Well, I wanted to go to college as a music major. My parents were like, eh, why don't you find something where you can get a job? <laughs> and so I, I was in music, but I also was in TV radio. The college that I went to, Ithaca College in upstate New York, had a long association with military bands. And as a freshman, I had to take a, a course called Career Orientations in Music. How do you get a job in music? And so there were public school teachers that would come in and talk about what it's like to teach music. Uh, we had a guy that uh, was an alumni from uh, on Broadway, and um, he came in and told what it was like to be in the pits. Uh, my jazz uh, band director was the guitar player for Chuck Mangione, if you remember him. Mm -hmm. He talked about what it was like to be a rock star. And then one week we had a panel discussion from faculty on what it was like to be in a military band. And various members of our faculty had served in military bands. Um, as a lonely freshman at the Phi Mu Alpha Professional Music Fraternity, uh, I was watching seniors graduate and go into the military bands in Washington, D.C. Very, very exclusive. The Marine Band, the President's Own, uh, the U.S. Army Band, Pershing's Own, the Army Field Band that travels for Chief of Public Affairs of the Army, the Navy Band. Um, uh, these older colleagues of mine were going in there. Um, so when I was a senior, <clears throat> I took my first plane ride from Ithaca, New York in the dead of winter um, with snow and everything to take an audition with the Army Field Band at Fort Meade. And it was horrible. <laughs> I, I got, to be blunt, I got airsick and I was definitely in no mood to take a trumpet audition. And to be blunt again, I really sucked. <laughs> and my recruiter was like scratching his head, Rick, I don't understand this. You're almost a college graduate and you didn't pass the audition? Go take another audition. So another guy and I drove to the military academy at West Point and I took another audition there. I got accepted. So um, it was off to basic training at, right after graduation from college and then to the U.S. Military Academy band at West Point, another of the premier bands. Um, one of the uh, amenities of being in a premier band is you have permanent stabilization. We have sergeants major who have spent 30, 35 years in one unit and never move and stay in those premier bands. My first experience was to find out what the Army meant by permanent because at the end of the Vietnam War, there was a general force reduction in the Army and the West Point band immediately got cut from 188 enlisted musicians to 99. And because I was a new guy, guess what? I helped. So I only lasted nine months at West Point due to this downsizing. Mm -hmm. um, I got reassignment. Interesting, if you look in your contract, 
quote, in accordance with the needs of the Army. And so I got reassigned to a little post band, but it was in New York City. And um, so I was at the 26th Army Band at Fort Wadsworth on Staten Island. The good thing about that was I had started a master's degree in uh, trumpet performance at the Manhattan School of Music. I was studying trumpet with Lou Soloff, who was the, one of the trumpet players with the famous rock band Blood, Sweat and Tears. And so I was into the whole music scene in New York City mm -hmm. and in the Army at the same time. But this band was a little post band. Then I heard about an opening in another premier band, the U.S. Army Field Band, the tours for um, Chief of Public Affairs. That was the band I auditioned for originally. I took another audition for them, and guess what? I passed. And so I spent 11 years in that band. I toured all over the uh, country. What was the name of that band? The U.S. Army Field Band, okay. Uh, okay. located at Fort Meade, Maryland. But they travel um, 30, 40 days at a time, TDY, uh, around the country, at least three tours a year. Figure 100 to 120 days on the road a year. Mm -hmm. A lot of time. Um, on the bus, okay? Uh, I did that for 11 years. Um, married? I, uh, you married during this time? I was. My, my wife was in the band. She played oboe. and um, Same same band? Yep. So exactly. you were together the whole time? Yeah, yeah. So okay. we were on the road together. Um, I finished my master's degree at Catholic University in Washington, D.C. while I was there. Um, my wife and I went through a divorce. And coupled with that, after 11 years... I was kind of tired of going on the road and I wanted to do something else. Um, and interestingly enough, we had a shortage of commissioned army band officers. There's only 18 or 19 of us in the entire army at any given time. Army's what, 500,000 to 750,000, those kind of numbers in the mm -hmm. active army. And there's only like 18, 19 of us and we still didn't have enough. So I applied for direct commission. This is a great study and, uh, uh, and just keep plugging away because um, I got rejected. I applied again. I got rejected. I applied again. I got rejected. Finally, I got accepted. Um, and by the time I put pin on of second lieutenant, uh, cutoff age is 30, waiverable to 35, and I was 34 and 11 months <laughs> at pin on. And so I just barely made it. So help me with the math. How many years were you enlisted then? I was 12 years, six months, and 29 days. 12 years and seven months, okay? So I got commissioned, <clears throat> but I did things backwards, sort of story in my life sometimes. Um, I got commissioned, but I wasn't an Army band officer. So I served two years as a personnel officer. I was with U.S. Military Entrance Processing Commands. So I'm pretty sure you probably know what a MEP station mm -hmm. is. I was in a headquarters that managed 25 MEP station. I was uh, headquarters commandant and the admin officer as an AG officer. But I went back to school again. I went back to Catholic University. Why? Because the Army did not have a course to teach an already commissioned officer how to be a band officer. So I earned a second master's degree in conducting then, once I had the piece of paper that said I knew what I was doing, I went to um, the U.S. Army Band, Pershing Zone, Fort Myers, and I took um, uh, the, right, right outside of Arlington here. Um, <clears throat> I took the Army Band Officer Conducting Audition with uh, a council of colonels evaluating me. And um, it was probably, in my estimation, the best day of my life in the Army. Um, why? Because I passed the audition. Mm. So uh, now I'm a full-fledged Army band officer. And my next assignment was at the Armed Forces School of Music, where we train Army bands, Navy bands, Marine bands, uh, musicians for bands out in the field. Um, we have AIT, Advanced Individual Training, uh, six-month course at that time. Um, before they go to a band, we had uh, what is referred to as ANOC and BNOC, Advanced and Basic Non-Commissioned Officer Courses for Section Leaders and Group Leaders. We had a Warrant Officer Bandmaster Course, and I went in as Commander of Staff and Faculty that did the teaching and the instruction. Um, did that for two years. Company commands normally a two-year assignment. Uh, got promoted to Captain, um, and then got moved to Director of, Director of Evaluation and Standardization. Uh, we had eight bands in Operation Desert Shield, Desert Storm on the Saudi-Iraqi border. Mm -hmm. And so I did uh, lessons learned, did a lot of interviews, just like we're interviewing here, uh, with uh, battalion commanders, brigade commanders, 
Command Sergeant's Major, um, is there a need for music on the modern day battlefield? Mm -hmm. It was the basic tenant. And the answer I heard exclusively from everyone was yes. Um, every time a military band comes in and plays for our troops, they're much more resilient. They're much more ready to train and fight. And it's a, a great morale enhancement on the battlefield. So we proved our worth, you know, through all these interviews. Well, guess what? Remember that time back in the West Point when I had to leave early? Uh -huh. It all happened all over again. After Desert Shield, Desert Storm, guess what? There were too many captains on active duty, okay? And they were offering those young captains fifty to $100,000 stipends just to leave the Army. Um, as a reserve officer on active duty, I had a mandatory retirement date of 20 years. But guess what? Let's do the math. 12 years and seven months enlisted, I don't have enough time for eight years as an officer to retire in grade. Um, and I, I was not feeling too good about things at that time. <clears throat> um, I spoke to a retired colonel who went to a congressman on my behalf, bless his heart. I really don't know what happened, but what I think happened is the congressman talked to Milperson, and all I know is my colonel called me one day and said, Rick, come down to my office. He had a a letter in an envelope through him to me. He said, we're going to open it together. And Milperson granted me a seven month extension beyond mandatory retirement date in order to retire in grade. So I retired as a captain, 03E. I was 43 at the time. And I felt, again, you know, kind of remorse. I got to have to take this off. I didn't want to do that, but I had to. Okay, my choices were retire or retire. <laughs> okay, and so what I'm going to do, I'm going to retire. And so, um, but in hindsight, what that did was it offered me time to start life all over again. Um, I became a radio broadcast technician at the Voice of America. And last January, after 22 years of service, I retired for a second time with a second pension as um, a supervisor and acting chief for a while of radio and multimedia operations at the Voice of America. Mm -hmm. um, so remember that other work that I did in college and TV radio, it came back in yeah. later life. Um, a general once said to me, there are two kinds of veterans and there are two kinds of retirees. There are those who never want to wear a uniform again and there are those who never want to take it off. So what happens if you're in the latter category? Um, I was fortunate to find out and learn in 2012 that there's a thing called the Maryland Defense Force. It's the State Guard that supports the National Guard, and it's mostly designed for disaster relief and recovery with training coming through FEMA. And uh, when I heard about it, um, I was invited to join, and I did. So I submitted my DD-214 form, and I was allowed to come in as a captain with three and a half years in grade from the Army, and serve with the Maryland Defense Force. Um, and believe it or not, they had a band. How great was that? Mm -hmm. So here I am in a band again. Uh, there was a vacant slot for public affairs officer for the band. Um, and so I was eligible for that. So I became the PAO for the band, <coughs> playing trumpet and electric bass guitar, and also leading our jazz band. So that was cool too. And this is like a volunteer type position? It's a volunteer thing. Every state does it a little bit different. Um, in Maryland, uh, we are grouped um, in legislation with volunteer firemen and volunteer EMTs. Uh -huh. So we do not get paid, but we get a $7,000 um, tax credit for our service if we do 100 hours or more of community service. And that's going to drill, uh, band rehearsals, uh, band performances, sounding taps as I do as, uh, uh, as a public affairs officer, going on missions and, and just like you're doing here, shooting, uh, interviewing people and the like, uh, doing press releases and so on and so forth. And so I usually do three to 400 hours a year, but that first 100 counts for my stipend. And right. that's regardless of rank. Uh, our lowest private all the way up to our commanding general gets the same $7,000. Uh -huh. um, so let me make an appeal to veterans and to retirees out there. If you would like to continue wearing your uniform, there's a place for you. We can use you. Uh, we have medics, we have engineers, we have cybersecurity uh, specialists. We can use any specialization at all. Um, about 25 or 26 states 
have these state defense forces. But if there's not one in your state, get together with some folks and start one. It falls under the military department of the state, along with the Army National Guard and the Air Guard. And there are significant work you can do. Um, shoot, I just turned 70 this year. Um, I applied for a wa age waiver. It was granted. Um, we have people that are pushing 80. Now, can we do everything that a young person can't? No. Disaster relief and recovery, you want to move sandbags around? Not me. Okay, can't do that anymore. But there are things you can do. And if you're a young person, and for whatever reasons, you couldn't get into the military, um, you know, they found something at MEPS that was medical that precluded you from going to basic training. Again, come join us in the Maryland Defense Force or your state defense force. We can use your, and they go by different names, by the way. Uh, California, I believe it's the California Military Reserve. Um, it's the New York Guard. Um, you know, um, it's um, Illinois Reserve, I believe. I can't remember. Uh -huh. But um, different names, different things. Uh, it's structured like a military organization um, uh, with a one-star general as the commanding general. Uh, they vary in size from 200 in some states to 2,000 in other states. Um, we get some used National Guard equipment. But a lot of times, like they said in the militia of old, you go to war with your own Kentucky rifle. And so... Uh, as a musician, nobody issues me a trumpet like they did in the Army. Nobody issues me an electric bass. I come with my own personal equipment to perform. And, uh, and so I'm still performing missions. Um, there are never enough trumpet players to sound taps for veterans' funerals and for commemorative ceremonies as well. And so here I am, 70 years old, and I'm doing the same missions I did when I was 22 in the West Point Band. You know, we did funerals at West Point. Young lieutenants during Vietnam come back, unfortunately, I'm sorry to say, buried in the Academy Cemetery. And I was the bugler on many occasions for those. And here I am, 70 years old, and where am I today? Arlington National Cemetery. And what am I doing today? Sounding taps. Fantastic. You know. It sounds like you love it. Um, I had a gent say to me one time, um, there are three stages of life. Learn, earn, and return. What does that mean? As a young man, um, you learned your craft. You learned how to do what it is you're doing here. And you served in a police force, so you learned how to do that. And then, what are you doing now? You're earning, okay? You earned when you were in the police force, when you were in the army, you earn doing your job right now. That's what I did when I was in the army. That's what I did when I was with Voice of America. So what happens when you get to be 70 like me? It's time to return, okay? Learn, earn, return. Um, as a young man, I wanted to play music so bad. Some kids like to play basketball. Some kids like to play baseball. I like to play trumpet. I like to play electric bass guitar. I wanted to play rock and roll. I wanted to play jazz. I wanted to play classical music. Okay. Marching, eh, not so much. Okay. Now, at 70, I understand the value of the ceremonial aspect of what we do. There is nothing greater than I can do than to sound taps for a veteran's funeral. There's nothing greater that I can do than sounding taps for a commemorative ceremony on Memorial Day, on Veterans Day, and the like. Mm -hmm. And so, uh, you know, at, at prestigious events like we were at today here at Arlington National Cemetery. And so this is a way I can give back to the community, okay? I play in our church band, okay? I play trumpet solo every now and then. My wife, as I mentioned to you earlier, is a professional harpist, retired from the Army. Where is she this morning on a Sunday morning at church playing harp and singing? That's a way she can give back to the community. Okay. Serving in the Maryland Defense Force is a way I can give back to the community. It's a way you can give back to the community as well um, by serving in a state defense force in your state. And like I said, if you don't have one, start one. Okay. The National Guard can use extra hands when it comes time for disaster relief and recovery. And even other times, a young man that was with me at Voice of America is an admin specialist, and they farm him out to different units in the National Guard 
to get their paperwork squared away. Um, I sometimes jokingly call him the Radar O'Reilly of the National Guard, mm -hmm. okay, because he goes here, he goes there, he goes here, and um, he puts their paperwork in order that because their drill time is limited and the amount of money, you know, because they got to pay for drill time, right? Uh, they just don't have the wherewithal to get everything the way it should be ship shape. And so he's a guy that can not get paid, gets that $7,000 stipend just like the rest of us, but he's saving the National Guard a boatload of money and he's doing them a lot of good, you know? And so um, there's many things to do with this. So let's go back to your active duty time. Sure. So you're on the road for 11 years. Yep. I, I can't imagine the amount of ceremonies that, that, that came out to you. Are there some notable- It wasn't ceremonies, okay? It's a public affairs unit, okay? So what we did were public concerts. Okay. Okay? Um, we would play, and it would be so different night after night. We would play in gorgeous, beautiful concert halls. And then the next night we're in a high school gym yeah. or we're at a place where they do rodeos out yeah, West. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Okay. You know, where it's dusty. Okay. Um, or, you know, I, I'm, I'm thinking of the Epcot center next to uh, Disney world down in Florida. Imagine in these dress blues, in the hot Florida sun, doing no. a matinee concert on a Sunday afternoon, Terrible. roasting, yeah. okay? Because back then, you know, we weren't allowed to wear the short sleeve white shirts or whatever, you know, like they have now. But, um, but yeah, it, it, uh, it's get on the bus, get off the bus, get off the bus, get on the bus, get on the bus, get off the bus. And um, um, any notable um, um, audience, VIPs? Um, uh, let me tell you about my second best day in the Army. I already mentioned my best day yes. in the army was passing the conducting. Um, these are right up there, right next to each other. Our band was the band that went to Europe to commemorate the 40th year of the D-Day invasion at Normandy, France, and accompany President Reagan. Awesome. Amazing, amazing experience. And my good friend, Master Sergeant Danny Nevis, is the guy that sounded taps Danny was the guy who sounded taps at the American cemetery. Nerves of steel, I tell you. Nerves of steel. He's on live TV internationally, worldwide. Okay? Amazing. We, now there was a lot of ceremonies. Okay? Mm. That was the exception to the rule. Were you we were at the Point to Hawk speech. We uh, we were the band that was at the Point to Hawk speech. Yes, sir. Unbelievable. Yes, yeah, we were there with President Reagan at Point to Hawk. That's awesome. Exactly, exactly, sir. Um, that was where we were. Um, the French treated us like we were our fathers, um, showering us, if you will, with French bread and wine. Um, I'll t this is just a funny story. I got to tell you this because it cracked me up. So the colonel decided this one day, a lot of stuff going on. He's an older guy. Pass it off to the captain, right? The captain's going to be the commander. He's going to conduct all these ceremonies. We're going to march here. We're going to march there. We're going to do this. We're going to do that. Left pre-dawn, five in the morning. Didn't get back till 10 o'clock at night, okay? It was a hell of a day, okay? We had MREs to eat in the bus because we're moving here, there, there, different little towns. This one, that one, over here, go here, go there. We had a unit that marched with us. It was 1st Infantry Division forward. Okay, so these soldiers are on other buses. Okay, we're playing, they're marching. Okay, we're traveling in convoy, go here, go there. We get to this one place and the French are so enthralled with having us there. They just gave us box upon box upon box of French wine. So now we're driving back to, um, we were in barracks in, a, uh, in in the gym of a girl's school or something, I don't know, on cots with sleeping bags. Not the usual palatial thing that the field band is accustomed to at Holiday Inns on the road in the oh. continental United States. Okay, all right, so it's a little bit different. So anyhow, we had a day that just beat our butts, okay? And the colonel didn't go with us, okay? 
And so, but our captain and the captain of, of the first infantry had negotiated this deal. Uh, French just gave us all this wine. So we just drank all the way back. Okay. So we get off the bus and we're just giggling and laughing. And I mean, the day that kicked our butt, we're just having a great old time. Right. And here's the Colonel. And I'll never forget this. He's in his blue pajamas, smoking his pipe with his Corfam shoes on. And he's looking at us, and somebody heard him say to our captain, says, you know, I figured after a day like this, the band would be down in the tooth, but they sound like they're pretty good. <laughs> you, know, you know, little did he know that we were all, you know, like umbiliago, you yeah, know, yeah. After, after drinking so much. You know? <laughs> and so that, that was a kind of interesting day. Mm -hmm. You know, but um, that whole experience was amazing. Um, another little, just aside from that, of course, in the field band, uh, we had our own um, transportation section. We had our own bus drivers. We had our own truck drivers. Um, they weren't roadies like I would expect in a rock band. They, you know, they'd get our stuff out, but we'd have to set it up and tear it down. Well, one of our drivers, um, nice guy, Mike Riccabini, um, left the field band. And he got to be a driver at the White House. Very prestigious. White House security clearance. And they give him a nice black suit with a vest, and he gets to drive. We get over to Normandy, and guess what? Mike Riccobini is President Reagan's driver for the presidential limousine. And it was, I don't know, for me and a lot of us, it was such a treat to see Mike over there in his new job, in his new role as as president reagan's official driver after he had driven all of us around you know mm -hmm. very cool. you know as a bus driver or as a truck driver for our equipment mm -hmm. and uh, and i'll never forget that it was great seeing him over there so we did normandy as part of a like a three or four week tour we started in nijmegen holland we went to ostend belgium we went to brussels belgium uh, we went to normandy uh soldiers course went to paris and then we went to germany and we spent a couple of weeks there town to town to town to town to town, ended in this huge plots, um, big open air space in Bonn, the capital of West Germany. And there were, and we had a guest conductor of, of a German army band, and we played everything that was on the program, and the Germans were just totally enthralled. More, 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 more. We went through every march we had in the book, and we ran literally out of encore pieces to play. And they're still asking for more. You know, that was an amazing day. Okay. Mm -hmm. And that's where our tour culminated at the end of, um, you know, in Belgium. Mm -hmm. I mean, in Germany, you know, after starting in um, uh, uh, the Netherlands and starting in Belgium, France, Germany. That was a great tour. It sounds like it. Always like that. You know. Once um, in a lifetime. Yep, absolutely. You know, so I, I treasured a lot of my time there. But I got to tell you, 11 years on the road is grueling and like i said that's a, one of these bands with permanent stabilization and so we have sergeants major who did 35 years on the road in that band and uh you know i'm astounded that you know they they just kept going and going and going and going and going you know and um of course when you're on the road um they want you to have a roommate because it cuts down on things so there's two guys to a room and um, um there was a joke going around that sometimes roommates last together longer than marriages do sometimes, yeah, 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 yeah. you know, you know, but, um, yeah, the army field band was, was a great experience. But for me, after a while, it was time to move on. And the other thing that was interesting with all that is, um, I definitely went out of my comfort zone. Okay. Um, I took on a bigger piece of the pie, a bigger chunk of the apple to be a commissioned officer. Um, there are so many things I learned and, um, about, leading people about managing people so when i got to the voice of america i'm a radio broadcast technician and i'm sitting in a studio one day and a manager comes in and he goes hey rick you ever think about being a supervisor i said well no he says, well you want to try it yeah sure so i was on tdy temporary assignment for years until they could finally get a permanent position and then it got permanent and then we didn't have a chief and so i went on tdy and i became the acting chief for a while off and on um we rotated it amongst us for a couple of years every other 120 days and um so i went back to the manager after i'd been supervisor for a while he said um 
why, um, why did you come in my studio and ask me to be a supervisor? I'm just kind of curious. They said, well, we need another supervisor. And we were trying to figure out who we could get to do this. Uh, we were looking for somebody that was like a radio station manager or program director or news director or whatever. Interesting way he phrased it. Um, somebody who had a job where they had to tell somebody else what to do. Mm -hmm. He says, we looked through some resumes, we didn't see much. Then we got to years and it said, company commander, U.S. Army. He said, that's the guy. That's the guy. And so I call it building blocks. One thing in your career leads to another thing, leads to another thing. So I went out of my comfort zone again from being a radio broadcast technician and an audio engineer to managing audio engineers and studios. And um, uh, again, each of these things, I learned a lot. Um, and again, I can use it in the Maryland Defense Force when I'm leading a band. Um, I, I've developed those kinds of skills for leading other people. You know, come prepared for rehearsal, not have a vision of what you want to do, explain how you want to do it, be cordial with everybody. Um, if somebody's having a problem, talk to them about it later. You know, don't do it in front of other people. Um, all these kind of things. These are things that uh, you can talk about it, but it's better to have learned it. And um, these are things I learned by le leaving the field ban, by becoming a headquarters commandant at MEPCOM, by becoming a company commander and a director of evaluation at the School of Music, and by being a supervisor and an acting chief at the VOA. So these are our skills that I can offer the Defense Force now, mm -hmm. now that I'm 70. Well, that, that leads into my next question, which is, sure. uh, let's say that you have a young kid that approaches you, um, says, hey, I'm 19, I'm thinking about joining the U.S. Army. What advice would you give to him to have a successful career? Um, I'm laughing because I'm thinking of what my dad said. First, let me talk to you about basic training. You know, don't volunteer for anything. <laughs> okay. All right. And remember the difference between the Boy Scouts and the Army. The Boy Scouts have adult leaders. <laughs> That's what my dad said. Okay, um, basic training is gonna only last eight weeks. It's not your lifetime. Deal with it, okay? Deal with it and you will get on to something better. Um, what I tell people now, you have an advantage I didn't have. <clears throat> it wasn't until I became a federal government employee that I could invest money in the thrift savings plan, which is a government version of a 401k. Guess what? Soldiers can do that now. If you become a member of the Army Field Band where you have permanent stabilization and, you, and you're sort of planning, well, I'm going to play the trombone for 20 years, throw some money in your thrift savings plan. I can only, I, no, I can't. I can't imagine what my TSP would look like now if I started investing in 1973 rather than investing in, well, you got to be vested for three years. So 1999 plus three is 2002. Uh, that's when my thrift savings plan started. And I ended in 2021. Okay. I did well. Okay. I did very well. But I would be a multimillionaire sitting in front of you if I had started throwing money in that in 1973. Young soldiers can do that now. Please do yourself a favor. And I know you don't think about retirement when you're 18 or 19, but throw money in your TSP by all means. Um, I had a teacher in college, jazz band director. He said, never turn down a gig because you'll always learn something from somebody. Whenever opportunity comes your way, seize it okay take it you know um you you will learn something from whatever opportunities come your way and guess what if you don't make it try again um there's a lot of stuff that's not on my resume okay um so sometimes i like to talk about failure okay remember i failed that first audition okay that didn't preclude me from joining the army i took the one at west point and guess what? A few years later, I took the same audition all over again with the Army Field Band, and I passed. Why? Because <laughs> I wasn't flying down from Ithaca, in New York, in the middle of the winter and getting airsick, okay? Um, so, um, and again, when I got commissioned, reject, 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 reject. Finally, I pass, okay? All right? So, um, initiative, perseverance, endurance, these are all skills, uh, you know, things 
you know, that will, will serve you well. So even if somebody says, no, man, sorry, you know, you're just not the guy. All right. You're just not the guy now. Okay. You may be the guy a year from now or two years from now. Okay. So it, don't let your dreams be dashed. Okay. Just get back, you know, to the practice room and practice some more trumpet, practice some more bass, take the audition again, you know, go back to college like I did and learn how to be a conductor. Okay. You know, good advice, you know, all right, here's the doozy. You ready? I'm ready for him. All right. So I guess I'm ready. We're, we're videotaping this, obviously, right um, now. Yeah, sure. Um, about four to six weeks from now, you're going to get a copy of the video. Oh, great. I hope you retain it. Um, Absolutely. But another opportunity you're going to have, uh, we're going to send you information on how to submit your story to the Library of Congress Veterans History Project across the river. Oh, absolutely. So yeah. Yeah. as long as we still have a country, hopefully, yeah. several hundred years from now, say 200 years from now, 300 years from now, right. when you're... One of your descendants, one right. of your relatives might stumble upon the video right. and watch it. Yeah. What would you want them to know about your service to your country? There's nothing greater than serving something that is bigger than yourself. That could be playing in church and serving God. It can be serving your country. In the Defense Force, it can be serving your state. Um, this was a 20-year music lesson that I got. I was 22 years old when I went to the West Point Band, fresh out of college. Boy, did I want to play trumpet. I wanted to play jazz trumpet. I wanted to play classical trumpet. My teacher's in one of the best rock bands in the world, Lou Soloff of Blood, Sweat and Tears. I want to be a rock and roll star. My big brother, when I pledged the music fraternity at college, Joe Bouchard, senior when I was a freshman, was the bass player for the Blue Oyster Cult heavy metal rock band. Okay? That was what I wanted to do when I was 22 years old. But I wanted to do it in the Army. <laughs> and I did. Okay? So guess what? I'm an old guy now. I edited that. Okay. <laughs> All right. I'm an old guy and I'm 70. And my perspective from 22 to 70 has changed. And so this is that return part of learn, earn, and return. To give back to, for something bigger than myself. What does that mean? That means sounding taps for funerals. That means sounding taps for commemoration ceremonies. Why? Because there's not enough. They're cutting bands. I mean, I'm sorry. It, it pains me. Okay. But um, there are not as many Army bands here on active duty now as there was back in 73 when I came in. Okay. Um, so who's going to do that? Um, so what do I want the generation of... 200 years from now to know, look at some way you can serve others. Look at some way you can give back to your country, to your state, to your church. Some way you can give back to the young people as a teacher, you know. Um, some way you can do something positive and constructive for our American society. That's what I would say. Well said. Well, I can't thank you enough for spending time with me uh, to tell your, your fascinating story. I learned a lot. Cool. And right. thank, thank you for you. your service. Thank you. Thank well you. Well done. Yeah. All right.